Good morning. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, I am Mark Urban. Uh, I work for the BBC. I've covered conflict well, pretty much for 35 years, so I've seen a fair bit of it close up. I've also written a number of uh, military history books, and I am on the board of the Imperial War Museum. So that's who I am, if you don't know me. Um, I think what we're going to do with this first session is really look in quite a sort of detailed way at the war uh, and its effect on European defence. That's the main aim of what we're trying to get out of this first session. So we'll start off by sort of getting a sense of where we are and then going on to, uh, you know, how does it end and what are the implications then for Europe? Um, because I'm going to sh be shamelessly populist in my instincts, I'm really determined to give you your 30 minutes of questions. So I will, uh, I'll try and limit my questions to the panelists um, to th just under 30. So hopefully that will give you guys a chance to ask your questions or a decent number of you. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming our first panel. Tim, off to the end, yeah, Siberia. And there we are. Well, um, so um, for, I will do the introductions. Uh, first, on my left is Will Jessett, who was in MOD for many, many years, involved in uh, drafting defence reviews, military planning at the highest level. Uh, then uh, General Sir James Everard, uh, Armoured Corps, uh, cavalry officer, I think, by... Mm -hmm by uh, formation and instinct, then involved in commanding a uh, brigade in uh, Iraq, uh, and later on uh, Deputy Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, which, for those of you uh, unfamiliar with this, the shape system, there's a lot of alliance management in that job. So uh, fantastic to have you here as well, James. Uh, Professor Helen Thompson, uh, Professor of Political Economy at Cambridge, uh, author of a fantastic book, uh, Disorder, Hard Times in the 21st Century, uh, who will, uh, I think, give us a lot of insights on geopolitics uh, and the way that will play out in the coming months and years. And then finally, Tim Marshall, uh, formerly a colleague of mine in the diplomatic core uh, of correspondence, or whatever you would call us, uh, uh, author of all sorts of fantastic books uh, on geography uh, and uh, interstate relations in general, and somebody who's been trying to make sense of these uh, developments as they've been going on. Uh, I'm going to go left to right here. So... Um, Let's start with you, Will. Um, I mean, I guess looking at what we've seen in, in the past uh, two and a half months, uh, is it to an extent sort of good news and bad news for Western defence? Good news in the sense that uh, our approach to things like combined operations or the fusion of intelligence and those sorts of things looks to be much better than that of the Russians. Bad news in the sense we'd run out of ammunition in two or three days. <clears throat> well, I, I suppose I'd start off by saying, you know, you've got to put this crisis into context and put defence planning into context. So you go all the way back to the 2010 Strategic Defence and Security Review, where we were saying, you know, confidently, no major state threat uh, at present. No state currently has the combination of capability and intent needed to pose a conventional threat to the territorial integrity of the UK. So 12 years ago. We then stepped through a, a series of events, uh, Russia invading Crimea in 2014. We take account of that in the 2015 review, um, where we get back into uh, you know, state-based threats really being a, a big deal, all the way through to the 2021 integrated review, where we're saying Russia continues to pose the greatest nuclear, conventional, military and sub-threshold threat to European security. So quite a quite a journey, I think, over 10 years. <clears throat> and that manifests itself in what we're planning for. So in 2010, we're planning to be able to rule on to brigade of forces through Afghanistan, because that was what was on our minds. And international terrorism was the thing. By 2015, we were back to war fighting at scale, being the kind of thing we needed to challenge. And then, as you say, Mark, you know, we're now into you know, complex, multi-domain, uh, operations against you know, aggressive um, state-based actors. And that manifests itself, doesn't it, in the way that you know, budgets, capabilities, plans come together. So from taking 8% out of the defence budget in 2010, uh, we then start to 
increase the budget from 2015 onwards, and then there's the huge influx in 2020, you know, the 16th or, 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 or 24. And I put it that way just to kind of put this thing into, into historic context and to say that over the last 10 years, 12 years, we've been building, we've been rebuilding our defence planning, we've been rebuilding our defence capabilities. So the three sort of headmark joint forces that we were asserting we would build in 2020, 2025, 2030, I would contend have most of the right characteristics associated with them. But your point, I think, is well made. It's something James and I were just talking about, to say this, needed, this needs and needed to happen more quickly than it currently has. So the reasonably well-documented shortage of munitions you know, has been a thing for several years, and it's not just munitions, it's, it's fighting vehicles, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there are clear capability shortfalls, um, but if you put this into the, sort of, you know, the historic context, I would say that we have built the capabilities that we would require, by and large, if this crisis continues to unfold. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, General, um, I mean, I look at this, what we've seen, and in a sense, a reminder of the First and Second World War, uh, artillery, the big killer, um, shocking in a way. I mean, I reckon at least 20,000 military dead, probably double that civilians, leveled towns. Um, but I wonder, for you, what are the standout impressions of this sort of re-emergence of state-to-state of -state warfare in Europe, and, and, and how do you interpret what's happened? Well, it is, um, you know, reading my New York Times this morning, there was a Ukrainian major describing it as a, you know, a war of position and a war of uh, artillery, and I think the big lesson you take is, is while you're drawn to new ways of warfare, the old ones don't disappear, and that is a, uh, is a challenge. And you know, I could talk to NATO. I mean, NATO don't have a formal approach to Ukraine because Ukraine's not a NATO member. Indeed, you know, NATO would say that Ukraine's not a crisis because that allows them to use the peacetime plans and measures they have to cohere uh, alliance activity. I think they've got some very good plans for the future that we could, you know, we could talk about if you like. Um, but you know, when it comes to Ukraine, we're currently, I think, observers. You know, giving them enough not to lose, not enough to do much more with, and we'll see where it goes. But I think the big point is that, that you know, the pattern of war hasn't changed. And when you look at things like the Integrated Review, which was, I think, pretty widely applauded in the Alliance for its intellectual rigour. They didn't always like the punchlines, but they, you, know, you would think that we now had to go back and revisit this, not just in the light of uh, Ukraine, but the lessons learned from uh, Afghanistan and indeed NATO's future plans for the deterrence and defence of the Euro-Atlantic area. Alan, I mean, a lot of people uh, put the emphasis on economic action, to, both to avoid this, the threat of sanctions, and now to, to sort of end it on terms uh, that would be to, to Russia's disadvantage. I mean, to what extent do you think that's viable, and to what extent do you think the underlying geopolitical realities, energy and all the rest of it, will dictate the outcome? Well, I think we have to, distinct, have to distinguish between two different things here where energy sanctions are concerned, or perhaps even three different things. The first of them is, is that I think that Putin has been taken aback that there have been any energy sanctions at all. So you know, the fact that the US and the UK uh, made a relatively quick commitment on, or to cut out Russian oil and the fact that the, the fifth round of the EU um, sanctions included an outright coal um, ban. Um, but on the other hand, he might have been shocked by that, um, but I don't see any evidence that this has actually changed any calculation that he's made during the, the course um, of the war. So then the question would become, if the EU really can um, put in place an oil sanctions agreement, and there's not such an agreement yet, the discussions have been on going on a long time, and if you listen to the language of the Hungarian government over the weekend, you wouldn't be particularly optimistic that the agreement you know, is coming um, soon. But if that were to happen, would that make a difference? 
And I think the difficulty here is, is even at best, we'd be talking about trying to phase out all Russian petroleum products, and that crucially involves diesel, only by the end of the year. So how does that sort of change anything over the, in, in, in the immediate term? That allows Russia the possibility of improving um, its capacity to export more petroleum products to Asian um, countries, though the shipping costs of that are quite considerable, extra shipping costs are quite considerable from the, the Russian point of view. It seems to me that the only thing that could really deliver um, would be something that was um, quick, done quickly, would be an immense shock, not just to Western economies, but to the entire world um, economy. And citizen, we'd all have to be prepared for that. And th that, I think, has the possibility of, of changing, or, or at least making Putin reconsider. On the other hand, the, the counterpart to that would be, well, if he's going to do that, they would also have to come off quite quickly. And I don't think that they would have to come off quite quickly as well, because I don't think the world economy can withstand it and the sacrifices that would be required for very long. I think there is a medium term to long term issue, though, which is the way in which it is the, the sanctions and the atmosphere around the sanctions has made it um, much more difficult for Western oil companies, total energies accepted, to stay in Russia. And that that will have an impact because Russia's future as an energy, well, at least as an oil producing power, depends on them developing alternatives to the Western Siberian oil fields, which have probably peaked in terms of their um, output. And they need um, capital, Western capital and technology to do that, particularly where the possibility of developing shale is concerned. And it's not so clear to me that the Chinese and Japanese companies could provide that and they're more willing um, to stay. So if we think of it as, do these sanctions make Russia's um, energy choices much more difficult in the medium term? I think very much so. Do they thus far change the course of the war? I think no. Thank you very much, Tim. I, I mean, I guess one factor in that is that um, Western Europe is plumbed in to Russian energy. Uh, with your geographical hat on, uh, to, to what extent uh, do you think geography will define uh, how this current round of fighting ends, <coughs> and basically it, it will be inevitable that a certain level of both commerce <coughs> and other types of interstate relations with Russia, whether Putin stays or goes, will have to be part of what comes out of this. Thank you. Good morning. Geography uh, underpins this, um, and I think it's the best example, and it will partially determine how it, how it ends. The background being, um, I mean, I, I start by looking at the geography of the situation, layering on the history and then laying on the politics. And then I think it comes together and the real experts drill down. So the geography of Russia, no warm water port, Crimea, <clears throat> flat land in front of it, Ukraine and Belarus and Poland. It has been invaded through that direction for so many times over so many centuries and genuinely does fear I think wrongly, um, there's no justification, but it genuinely fears it, and that's the deep background to it. it. It, under someone like Putin, cannot allow a vibrant democracy which is looking westwards in Ukraine. So that's, that's the geography um, of it, and then there's this history of them being invaded, and the low watermark for Putin was probably 1999, Kosovo, which uh, we were both there, and it was Putin who whispered into Yeltsin's ear in 99 and said, get yourself to Pristina. And they came down from Bosnia and made themselves a player. I think that was the point where the tide stopped coming into Russia and they started pushing back out. And when you look at everything that he's done on foreign policy, it is about pushing back out from Moscow, not just in front of them, but also uh, f f further round to um, <clears throat> well, actually, 360 degrees, they've been trying to push back out. And in 2014, they could only give themselves a small buffer zone <coughs> and guarantee their warm water port, which the lease was up in 2042. And they've spent the last few years preparing to push that tide further out. And then, to everybody's surprise, they've come a cropper. Now, as for the geography of it now, uh, again, the military experts will know more, but they struggled because through the Priapet marshes, it was boggy, the, the, it was only frozen for a short period of time. General Frost was back in fashion and had a vote. 
Now, with the tank battles in the south, it's flatter, harder ground, and there's going to be some very tough fighting. And overall, the Americans, I think, when they went to Kiev three weeks ago, uh, Lloyd Austin went, and at that point, I thought I saw a shift. The Americans have gone from containing the situation and managing the situation and giving the Ukrainians uh, enough to just to manage. I think they've made a strategic decision to now inflict a serious defeat upon Russia. And I think that Liz Truss's speech <coughs> last week to the Mansion House <coughs> put Britain on that same page. And this is, again, part of geography. At the biggest picture, the Americans have always intervened when they see one big dominant power trying to dominate the continent of Europe. If it looks like it's going to do it, they step in. They've done it again. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I just wonder, picking up from <clears throat> Tim's point there, almost about sort of war aims, uh, I mean, it's still relevant to this question, how does it end? Yeah. And the West, <laughs> and to what extent the West is willing to just carry on uh, fueling Ukraine in its desire to retake all of its lost territory, even if that includes Crimea. I mean, is that a realistic and wise <clears throat> thing for Western countries to commit themselves to? Well, <clears throat> it seems to me that we've got a, you know, that there is still a need to try to reconcile um, what Ukraine is looking to get out of this, um, what British politicians and um, you know, other Western politicians are saying what's being said in the EU, what's being said in NATO, it doesn't seem to me to be sort of, you know, quite reconciled at the moment. And it's important. Uh, it's important that there is um, the best possible alignment on, on that because you know, it is the, you know, the Ukrainians, it's Zelensky, who's going to have to go to the table and, and do a deal. Um, and there's, a, you know, there's an issue associated with this, isn't there, Mark, which is you know, the, the growing risk of some sort of escalation of the crisis as, you know, as Ukraine does begin to, you know, push back at that border. Um, you know, we've all been reading, haven't we, the kind of, you know, the nuclear doctrine, the nuclear policy that's, that's, been, that's been coming out, the increasingly assertive statements that um, Putin and others have been making, um, and measure that against the kind of the language on you know, what is existential for Russia, exactly um, Tim's point. And you've got quite an unhealthy mix of issues there, which do require, it would seem to me, you know, greater clarity than we have currently got about um, you know, the reconciliation of Western and Ukrainian ends uh, in order to see some sort of end to this. When do you think that gets untangled or, 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 or <coughs> sharpened? Because an attack on Crimea is, I mean, if that's what the Ukrainians want to eventually press, press on and do, is a real red line for Russia, isn't it? Yeah. It is now, as far as they're concerned, part of Russia. Yeah, I mean, so, so I don't see how and when this does become untangled, particularly. I mean, we were all, weren't we, you know, listening with interest to the speech this morning. Um, that doesn't seem to have gone anywhere particularly new. No. So that doesn't, you know, that doesn't add very much to this. Um, we've heard Zelensky being, you know, increasingly emboldened, I think, by, by what is happening. But I don't think we've yet really heard, at least recently, you know, what his, what his goals are. Some weeks ago, they seem to be, you know, potentially more limited than perhaps they are becoming. General, um, you said in your first answer the old uh, ways of war have shown us that they're still very much uh, part of the way that states when they collide will try and resolve huge questions like this. I just wonder, just picking up on what well, we were discussing with Will about the possible Ukrainian reconquest of lost territory. Firstly, whether you think they can, are they capable of doing it? Uh, or, 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 and whether, if they're not, some kind of stalemate does inexorably lead towards a negotiated outcome. Um. Well, it comes to that. When does this get untangled? I don't think it gets untangled until the current phase of the war stops. Mm. I think Putin's generals will still think that they can win in the east and establish a new uh, front line uh, along the river. Dnieper, secure the south, you know, uh, and that would be their start point, I think, for that. But I, I look at the evidence, and I don't think that they can achieve that without escalating significantly conventionally or potentially 
you know, some form of nuclear escalation, you know, tactical nuke, not, not massive nuke. But again, I think for Putin, I mean, that would represent for me a failure at a grand strategic level, I think the consequences would be hugely negative, and so I hope he doesn't, uh, he doesn't go there. But I think you know, that we're at the start of a, of a long war for Ukraine and a new Cold War uh, for uh, NATO. Uh, I don't think that Russia would allow Crimea to be retaken. I think you know, that's just... I know people talk about it. It just seems very, very uh, difficult to me. And when it comes to end states, I mean, I, I, we probably get a vote in, in the West because, you know, we're, we're supporting them so much. But in the end, I think it has to be Ukraine that decides whether the end state is the status quo ante or, or something more or less than that. Uh, but I don't think that can be decided until, uh, until we have a sort of pause in the battle uh, at the end of this phase. And Helen, if, if that does happen, say at some point later in the summer or something like that, um, you were talking about the facts of life as far as energy are concerned, the fact that there isn't any easy uh, answer to this. Uh, there's been a lot of emphasis in the EU on looking for alternative sources of supply. To what extent have those things delivered by the end of summer or the end of the year? And to what extent does the energy dependence still define the outcome from a Western point of view? I, mean, I don't think that there's any way of changing the energy situation and the energy choices by the, by the end of the, the year. And if you want to look at the, the factor, that one factor that tells us this most clearly at the moment, it's diesel. Um, mm. uh, diesel prices, um, diesel prices um, and gasoline prices are pretty much completely separated from each other and diesel prices are now at their, at their highest ever um, level and that is true despite the fact that the price of crude oil is about $70 a barrel cheaper than it was at the previous height of, of crude oil in the middle of 2008. And then when you throw in that diesel is the fuel that basically keeps the supply chains of the world economy going um, through shipping and trucking that this is a massive, massive um, issue. I think in terms of alternative um, supplies and the situation um, for European countries, um, particularly where gas uh, is concerned, is what we need to understand is that once Germany next year, or from its point of view hopefully next year, is able to import liquid natural gas, so is able to, to, to import seaborne gas and move away um, from pipeline um, gas from Russia, which is a very significant portion, proportion, obviously, of its gas imports. That is going to be a, a pretty massive shock to world gas markets because there has not been a world gas markets in which Germany does this. And 2021 had already seen a huge shock to um, natural gas markets because China's demand for um, gas imports went up 20% in 2021, causing huge price shock both for Europe and for Asian countries. Europe for those countries that were importing um, liquid natural um, gas. So I just don't think we can underestimate how difficult this energy situation is. Now, that doesn't mean that we should just say, OK, we, we can't you know, have objectives. We in the West can't have objectives that are supportive of Ukraine, but we must do so with open eyes about what the energy consequences of what we're doing are and then have strategies for dealing um, with that. And that's probably going to mean, you know, like looking at, you know, significantly reduced energy consumption. Thank you. Tim, I mean, we've been talking a bit about does this stutter to a halt uh, later in, in the summer or later this year? Uh, uh, and I suppose um, what I sense is, is in the West, a lot of people <coughs> yearning for signs that either Putin will be finished by this and overthrown, or, or in some ways so weakened, uh, you know, I suppose it's the Lloyd Austin line, that he never thinks of doing anything like this again. But I wonder to, to what extent, regardless of, of what happens to Putin personally, um, the geopolitics uh, and the underlying attitudes in Russia will mean that the threat does not disappear 
or even that a leader worse than Putin in the sense of being more nationalistic yeah. and doing what the army thinks is necessary to subjugate Ukraine might emerge. Yeah, just as um, Trump did not uh, come out of nowhere, the conditions of it produced him, uh, and just as when Xi and Modi have disappeared, the Himalayas will still be there, these underlying things that we discussed at the beginning are still in place, whether it's Putin or not Putin. Now, if there was a genuine, uh, like a, a, a Czechoslovakia situation after the fall of the wall, where you get someone like Vaclav Havel emerging and leading uh, Czechoslovakia and now the two countries into democracy, liberal democracy, uh, then Russia could take a different turn. But there's been no period in Russian history when they've really had civil society especially once you move it outside of the two main cities, they've never really had democracy. So I don't see what would produce a Havel in Russia. So consequently, take Putin out of the picture. You might get a temporary, uh, a temporary solution, but uh, there, I don't think there is a solution to this as long as Russia is the type of country that it is, and that is manufactured by its geography and, and its history. And I personally think this will go on all year, I think the economics of it are very, just as equally as important, if not more important than mm. the military. Um, and it never finished after 2014. There's actually been fighting constantly for the past eight years, more than that now. So um, basically it doesn't <coughs> finish until Russia changes and Russia isn't changing. Um, I'm going to open this up at about <coughs> 10 miles to, to, to fulfill my commitment to giving you guys half the session in terms of questions. So what I want to do in the last <coughs> portion of this is be, in a sense, more detailed or literal about lessons uh, for Western defence uh, and maybe start off, well, with the idea of, of kind of revisiting defence reviews. I mean, I was in <coughs> Kiev until a couple of days before the war started. There was a day when the ATMs weren't working, one or two other things happened. And people said, oh, yeah, this is the cyber attack. Um, and then they were back on in three hours. And I, I thought to myself, is this it? Is this what all these experts in various departments and think tanks have been telling us about for years? Is this, or, or have we not seen it? Uh, and those other types of warfare that have been very much emphasised in the latest uh, review, should we be just pausing a little bit and thinking about, you know, numbers of missiles we've got or numbers of F-35s, yeah, mass, I suppose, is the crude term, yeah. before investing quite so fully in those, uh, I guess, uh, non-kinetic or, or other domains? Well, I think cyber, you know, doesn't, hasn't featured as widely in this crisis as many of us expected to. Um, of, of course, we, we won't necessarily be seeing, you know, some of the behind the scenes things that are, that are happening in cyber. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, and of course, it's a relatively new domain. You know, it's still developing as, a, as an art. Um, so I don't think we have yet seen enough to conclude that you know, cyber hasn't had a role, won't have a, an increasing role as, as we go forward. Um, <clears throat> but I think your, your, your wider point about the need to run a rule again over where we got to in the latest review feels to me to be right. I heard uh, Tony Radican and David Williams from the MOD doing a, a thing at the IFG a couple of weeks ago where I thought that they were actually quite measured and were sort of saying, you know, it's too soon to rush into this, but, you know, this is, it's all very well to run through the series of reviews that I described, you know, using a set of planning assumptions that mm. we might be in a, in a big scrap. Um, this is now changing. We're not yet in a big scrap, but the situation is a lot worse um, in terms of stability and security in Europe than we were expecting. So I think it does require, you know, and James will speak to this, looking again at <clears throat> some of the choices that were made on platforms, numbers of platforms, as you say, you know, this has been very largely a missile war, hasn't it? We've known for a long time that munition stockpiles are low. Um, you know, we're scrambling now to, to, to restock make some them, more, yeah. to make some more. Mm. Um, but as you say, it's also about, you know, whether the, the platforms that we're develop developing and bringing into service are the right ones. <clears throat> This debate about mass, I think, is really interesting and, and, and really important. A lot of people I know are moving very quickly to say, huge mistake to 
reduce the size of the army to where it is, and you know, we must begin to recruit a bigger army from, from now on. To which I sort of say, well, maybe, you know, not yet proven. Um, picking up uh, uh, Will's description of this as a missile war, um, does uh, investing a huge amount in a carrier that has to be really quite close to the enemy coastline because of the range of its aircraft uh, make sense to you now, General, or equally tanks, or equally manned aircraft, the things that in a way define the culture of our armed forces, those prestige platforms, do they look vulnerable now? I mean, it's, I was down in Portugal last week at uh, Striking Force NATO looking at the lessons they learned from integrating the Harry S. Truman into the NATO uh, order of battle. I mean, you know, these are aircraft based in the Adriatic, which are striking targets in Estonia. I mean, they make a huge difference. And so, you know, you definitely need aircraft carriers. As I made the point, I mean, these new ways of walking, uh, work of warfare are right, just you, you can't forget the old ones. You need troops to seize and hold ground, you need troops for urban fighting, and, and you need huge quantities of artillery and rocket uh, ammunition. Um, and I mentioned it earlier, I mean, I think you know, the integrated view was, was people liked its intellectual rigor, they just didn't like the punchlines, you know, configuring to operate below the threshold of warfare and returning to, to war fighting at graduated readiness, a modern division in, in 10 years. And of course, a reduction of combat power to NATO, which, which doesn't make sense, I think, given the fact that our leaders have signed up to a new concept for the deterrence and defence of the Euro-Atlantic area. And I'll just, you know, it's based on a very simple idea, you know, that, that in order to deter, you have to unambiguously demonstrate the ability to defend. The defence requires you to control geographic areas and the domains of warfare simultaneously. So it's a very simple idea, but it needs mm. combat power to make it, to make it work. And hugely expensive, of course. Helen, um, <clears throat> you've been very uh, uh, direct about the dependencies, uh, diesel fuel, the gas infrastructure, the other things that mean, you know, with one bound, Europe cannot be free in this sense. I mean, uh, to what extent can you be prescriptive uh, and say, what would help? Uh, what should Europe uh, as a collective be doing uh, in the coming months to try and change the calculus? <coughs> Well, I think that the, the energy transition is obviously part um, of this. But at the same time, we need to understand the ways in which the, the present tense situation with fossil fuel energy is itself a constraint on the energy transition because very high fossil fuel energy prices mean that the inputs for the energy transition for green energy are more expensive than they would um, otherwise be. And nothing that's happening with the war um, changes the, in some sense, the physical difficulties of the energy transition. It doesn't in itself provide the technological mm. breakthroughs that are necessary where um, storage um, are concerned. I mean, the thing that I think in some sense is positive or encouraging about where we now are on the energy side is, is that I think all illusions that people had about energy and its importance, or i.e. denying its importance, in every respect, have shattered. It's shattered geopolitically um, because nobody's any longer going to say that dependence on Russian energy is of no geopolitical consequence. You, know, you didn't need too much, I think, um, paying attention to this to understand the ways in which Putin was deliberately um, creating, reinforcing European energy dependency through the last couple of years, sorry, the last couple of decades, mm. and the way in which he was using the pipelines um, for that. I think that nobody can any longer have any you know, illusions about the fact that there are some structural reasons why the prices of oil and gas and perhaps surprisingly coal are actually as high as they are. And that was true in the autumn before the, the war came. And I also don't think anybody can any longer think that you can kind of separate out those energy issues from the energy transition. But what everybody has to do, all governments have got to do, is find a coherent energy strategy that deals with all aspects of the energy situation as a whole. And, and, and I think that the space for doing that is greater, actually, than it was before the war. Because minds have been focused. Yeah. Tim, uh, I'm going to ask you one last question, and then, and then we'll throw it open, which is, I mean, you, you don't just do geography. You do all sorts of aspects of human uh, interaction. I'm just, I'm thinking about lessons and do we change things. And at times in this, it's occurred to me that Putin 
going for professional armed forces was in a way a massive self-own because uh, uh, he now faces this dilemma, do I have to mobilize the country, which he's politically very reluctant to do. Uh, and our Western countries, I mean, we see now Ukraine able to mobilize literally hundreds of thousands of people. We look at Finland and say, well, the great thing about Finland is they have a system where from a standing army of 22,000, they can go up to hundreds of thousands. And indeed, Poland has tried to have a sort of hybrid system. Um, is there a lesson there, even for a country like this one, which traditionally doesn't uh, engage in prolonged <coughs> continental wars uh, and think it needs lots of military no. uh, man and woman power? No. No, you think it's not, it doesn't read a problem. <coughs> well, I expand. No, because, and this takes us back to cyber, um, the, the mistake by Putin is not that he doesn't have a conscript army, it's just that they have used the army that they have incredibly badly. Yes. It talks about it. To I saw some footage the other day of some tyres on uh, one of the armoured vehicles. It had USSR on it. Mm. They're using tyres that are 40 years old to fight a war in 2022. That's one of the reasons they're losing, not because they don't have a conscript army. It makes sense for Finland and the Baltics. I think Lithuania has conscription now. We introduced it a few years ago. It doesn't make sense for us. And going back to cyber, because that's part of this answer, I think they haven't used it because it's held in reserve. They are very good at it, but so is Ukraine, but also so is the United States and increasingly the UK. And I don't know the degree of plausible deniability we could have, but there is a price to pay for fighting cyber war. In the longer term, we are in this movement where mass is still important. I suspect mass will always be important, but mass is increasingly controlled by cyber. And anyone who doesn't put money into that is going to lose. Great. Thank you. <coughs> uh, do we have roving microphones? Yes, we do, on each flank. Um, the, the gentleman at the back on this side was the first person I saw raising his hand. So let's, let's open it up and we've got... Very much. Hello, Mark. Um, I'm David Lyon, former colleague sorry, from yeah, the BBC, my glasses on. Um, now, um, now visiting senior fellow here at King's. Um, and I want to go back to a comment that Will Jessett made right at the beginning about the pivot from Afghanistan to state-on-state -state warfare um, in this last decade. And of course, the attack on Crimea in 2014 came coincidentally with the end of NATO combat operations in Afghanistan. Um, and I wonder if um, we're in danger in moving towards tanks and, and uh, big mobile armies, which armies feel very comfortable in training for, in losing the lessons of Afghanistan and losing the lessons of counterinsurgency and these complex interventions, which we've fought over the last 20 years and may well have to fight again. Is that directed? It's principally at will, but I'd like to hear uh, the general's comments as well. Yeah. <clears throat> well, so we, we spent a lot of time, didn't we, thinking about um, what happened in Afghanistan and what went well and what went badly. And, you know, let's bear in mind, you know, how it ended and let's be realistic about, you know, what sort of conflict it was. But, <clears throat> you know, James will, will recall just how much effort went into thinking through um, the lessons that we picked out of the successful parts of the counterinsurgency operation. So kind of, you know, very strongly, I think, embedded into British military doctrine and certainly informed all the work that has happened since. Um, so the, the big policies that get most focus out of the most recent reviews are, you know, the, the white papers themselves. But it was a, an integrated operating concept that was published as a prelude to the, to the integrated review and the command paper uh, that, are, that are in many ways the most interesting. And they do, as, as you've said, Mark, you know, take us a long way into you know, sub-threshold um, and you know, grey zone and cyber and space and, and all of that. But that's not all they do. I think those documents are actually quite sober about the sorts of conflicts that we'll need to get into. And they don't, um, they certainly don't um, expect that we're not going to get into um, further, you know, difficult uh, counterinsurgency style operations into the future. Um, I don't think that they're immediately foreseeable, but I don't think they're ruled out either. So 
I think the picture is rather better than us, you know, simply forgetting the hard won, hard learned lessons about of Afghanistan. It does feel to me like the essence of those has been incorporated into into that update and doctrine. But Jane. <clears throat> so start with the return to collective defence and big armies. I, I mean, I think these armies won't fight the way that, that armies have been fighting, even as we're seeing you know, at the moment. I mean, this is the era uh, of multi-domain operations. I mean, it's not yet working as we want it to, but, but we will uh, get there. And you know, what you might call distributed mission command. In the old days, as a tank command, if you penny package your forces, people would condemn you. But now you penny pack it to survive, and you're given huge autonomy. And you don't concentrate force to kill the enemy. You concentrate fires to kill the enemy. Uh, and I think it's interesting that how do we judge progress in this war? We judge it by the land that is seized and is held. And to seize and hold land, you need large numbers of troops. And to manoeuvre troops around the battlefield in a way that they can win the fight and survive still requires combined arms groupings, just cleverly used. So we will we'll screen with drones and clear with artillery. You know, your distributed mission command, much smaller packets of forces. You know, all these, all these ideas are, are in the process of being delivered. You know, the third division last year was in America experimenting on many of these things. And cyber, of course, will bear a big part. And there's a very good, if you haven't seen it, Microsoft open source report on the uh, use of cyber in this campaign. And there has been significant use of destructive cyber uh, by the Russians uh, against the Ukrainians. And chatting to a Ukrainian the other day, he described that you needed a can-do attitude. Uh, and I think that is quite interesting, that can-do attitude has made it seem to us as though there hasn't been any cyber. But there has. There's been a lot. It's a very good report. But it just tells me it's not quite the decisive arm that some of us hope it is going to be. Um, on lessons learned in Afghanistan, I mean, you know, I think there is lots to learn there. I think in capacity building in particular. And there's a very good uh, NATO report that's just about to go to production which sort of says that capacity building in support of fragile, you know, sovereign states doesn't work very well. Mm. Yeah. I would have thought, David, that <clears throat> all that investment in um, hunting terrorists, uh, 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 fusion of intelligence, I-Star, all those other things, is, is one of the paybacks, isn't it, for the war on terror? If you look at the number of Russian generals, but um, well, that's the it. point. That those skill sets get built into your model for collective defence and war fighting. It was it was a twenty year campaign, and yeah. we didn't know in two thousand and one um, uh, any of the lessons that we knew in fifteen years later. And I, I just fear that we might be losing some of those more complex lessons that aren't aren't. Uh, uh, as technical, but they're about you know, troops on the ground and counterinsurgency and how you work, how you fight wars among the people. My fear. Thanks, David. Um, Suzanne Rain, who's sitting in the midst, right in the centre, in the most hard to reach <coughs> position for any microphone wielder. <coughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, Suzanne Rain, I'm a visiting professor at King's and also um, with Mark on the board of the Imperial War Museum. I have a question about capability. We talk particularly at the moment, about materiel as a capability and about building materiel capacity. And obviously, in the middle of the war, that's the thing that you see. But the bit that sits behind that, and arguably before that, is the decision-making capability and decision-making capacity. And part of that is actually built into the integrated review in, in a way, but also you could argue that it's at the heart of some of the things that Will was talking about, about do we have the best alignment in Europe in terms of what we think we should be doing next. And if you're talking about deterrence, deterring Russia, you have to be thinking, how do we, how do we alter Putin's risk calculus? So, so all of that is essentially about how we think and how we project our thoughts in, in a credible way. So I'd be really interested in your views on what more could be done to improve decision-making capability and capacity in the UK, but also very much in NATO and, and in Europe, so that we can really affect, as Helen was saying, you know, we haven't seen really anything that we've done in the economic side yet change how Putin's thinking. 
How could we, how could we improve that? Mm. Thank you. <clears throat> Who'd like to well, I'll, 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 I'll have we'll a, jump in initially? I'll, I'll, I'll have a quick go at it and say, you know, I, I don't know as a matter of fact you know, where the decision making is being done in the UK on, on this, I assume, um, very largely through the NSC or some sort of small group of the NSC. Um, where you would need to bring you know, everybody together, including, very importantly, the, the energy component of, uh, of this. And in the national debate, that doesn't yet seem, I think, to have featured you know, as widely as, as maybe we should expect for the reasons Helen's spoken about. <clears throat> um, but it, it's how you then sort of, the, the point I was getting to on war aims, I suppose, is how do you then align that better you know, across Western nations? Because Again, James and I were talking on the way in and saying, you know, there's been reasonable, I think, American leadership on this, but, you know, you've had American positioning, you've had something different in the EU, you've had something quite different in, in NATO and something different here. So there doesn't really seem to be a multinational, multilateral forum in which you're really bringing together, you know, key um, decision makers to talk about those big issues, the kind of, you know, the war aims and all of that. You know, you're still doing G7, you're still doing all these kind of groupings, but they're, at this stage in something that's important as this, one would have thought by now there would be a kind of a bespoke piece of international machinery and maybe a bespoke piece of national machinery. Maybe there is, maybe there are both, but I can't see what they are. A sort of contact group. Yes. Um, Helen, do you want to come in on the deterrence <clears throat> point? I mean, clearly Putin was not deterred because he didn't I mean, believe the threat. What I would say is this is, I think, where the energy sanctions are concerned, the only possibility to change the calculus is something that's very drastic and very quick. Mm. Um, because anything that allows Russia a longer period of adjustment, which means essentially replacing you know, European market share with a higher Asian market share, I think at least allows him to think that the risks of continuing are worth it. What we have to understand, though, is, is that anything that would change his calculus in terms of the size of the energy sanctions and the immediacy of them would be a seismic shock mm -hmm. to the world economy. Uh, and you have uh, a number of, of um, developing countries in the world that are already on the <coughs> precipice where a set of issues um, around fuel and, 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 and food are, are concerned. So to take that as the option, and I'm not saying it should be ruled out, but there has to be a strategy for what that, that, what that, that means um, too. Now, I have no idea how these things are thought about in the people who are making the decisions in the, in the, um, in the UK, but I, I slightly worry that it can be seen, that the decision making can be should we, what's the way of putting this? Not sufficiently focused on the worldwide consequences. Mm. Mm. Uh, Economic, yeah. yeah of so what, a sort of contact issue. group, but with an element to, is is what's needed to sort of, heart, but with a an economic element as well as a strategic and, and political element. Um, next question. Yes, the woman there. Who's, <coughs> yeah, we've just about got the microphone in time there to. Hi, my name is Christine Chang. I am a lecturer here in the study, in the uh, Department of War Studies. And I have a simple question for you. Um, do you think military escalation is basically inevitable? And I ask that just with a bit of background framing. So the way that I see this playing out is, is basically that Putin is backed into a corner. He, this has become essentially an existential fight for him. And then on the NATO side, it has also become, we have turned it into an existential fight, both for ourselves and also for Putin. And it's obviously an existential fight for Ukraine. There is now no incentive for anybody to back down. That whole structure of, of peaceful negotiation has fallen away now. It feels like we're in for a very long insurgency, as some of you have already indicated. But is there a peaceful way out? Is there a different way out? I know that's a really hard question, but I'm, I'm hoping to, some of you can imagine a different way out because I personally can't, and I'm looking for a little bit of hope here. Tim, do you want to give the, hope? The moment you said it was a very simple question, I thought, <clears throat> no, it isn't. There is a way out, sure, uh, and it's compromise. 
uh, but that's in short supply. Um, we saw when Erdogan and Bennett and Macron and others were trying to put together some sort of compromise deal about three weeks in, the, the vague outlines of what could be achieved. Um, and that would be something along the lines of February the 24th, which is a bit of a problem for Putin. Mm. But if you can manufacture it, uh, if you can lie convincingly enough that he got something out of it, uh, you could go back more or less to February 24th. Uh, he definitely keeps uh, Crimea. Um, various beautifully crafted worded statements that allow him to sell something. Um, but that's the only way. Uh, and no, I'm not hopeful. Um, I think Putin is in trouble, as we said, as you said. I think when Finland and Sweden join NATO, he's in even more trouble because you know, he is trying to stop NATO expansion and possibly has has failed. So I think in Ukraine, his only way out is to uh, escalate. I don't think NATO are yet caught in that trap. I think NATO haven't needed to make a decision yet. You know, it's not a crisis for NATO at the moment. And building up to the summit in June, I think they will form an opinion and give it. And, and you know, NATO spent a lot of time working on their decision making. Coming back to your earlier question, you know, decision making at the speed of relevance is a, is a big subject. Uh, and actually, although we all tick about it, when you look at the evidence, every time they are presented with an immediate challenge, they make a decision. You know, it, it's pretty good. Uh, I think our challenge, though, is the fact that many people have never been through this before, you know, understanding the theory of deterrence. I mean, people are terrified of provoking Putin, but if, you, if you're not prepared to escalate when you deter, you can't, you know. So I think it's education of our leaders is, is one of the challenges. Um, but I think, you know, NATO haven't had to make a decision yet. As I said, I think when the current phase of the war runs its course, um, you know, I think NATO can then decide what its strategy is going to be. Yeah, I, I suppose the other potentially difficult conversation in NATO uh, in terms of the sort of compromise that you were talking about, Tim, is at what point does pressure get put on Ukraine? Mm. Yeah. N not, not to accept... Uh, the permanent loss of... Or to oh, Sorry, I beg your pardon. Or to yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but either way, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, there'll, there'll be pressure on Ukraine at some point either way. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, certainly in uh, the days running up to the war uh, in Kiev, I heard a lot of resentment that Schultz and Macron had tried to put pressure on, on uh, Zelensky to concede something in Donbass or somewhere else. So it, it, even the idea of it was, was really... Uh, uh, violently opposed, I think, in Kiev at that time. Uh, and, and of course, they've, since then, they've uh, achieved extraordinary things. Um, this gentleman <coughs> here had a question. Uh, yeah, I think he's raised his hand, so you can probably say, I don't know, I, I can be held guilty of favouring this side of the room, and the other microphone wielder has had no <coughs> actual battle experience yet. So, ah, there's someone there. <coughs> But let's, yeah, so we'll, we'll, this one first, and then Paul, I think it is, at the top there. Uh, Neil <coughs> Collins, I'm a financial journalist. Um, I have a question for Professor Thompson. Um, I think that uh, a tax on Russian oil and gas, uh, where the proceeds are paid to the IMF, uh, would mean that there's no, never going to be a shortage of it but it would start to produce a very substantial sum which could be used for uh, rebuilding Ukraine. Uh, it would demonstrate uh, how much of the world is prepared to, uh, to pay up for Russian gas and also gives a huge incentive to find alternative supplies. Uh, and uh, it wouldn't matter if the whole the whole world didn't join in. If the major Western countries did, uh, that would be sufficient. I think at the moment you can buy Russian oil at about a $35 a barrel discount from the world price, uh, which gives you some idea of the amount of money that could be available. Uh, and best of all, it would make Putin absolutely furious. <laughs> well. I mean, I, I definitely think there's got to be, you know, creative uh, thinking, um, because as we both, I think, agreed that the, the supply side of, of it, particularly in, in the short term, is really, really 
um, difficult. I think, though, you've still got to be really clear about what your objectives are with this. I mean, it'd be one thing to say, OK, we're doing this um, because it will, when peace, whenever it comes, or relative peace, finance, Ukraine's recovery. But do you think that that makes any difference um, to Putin's calculus right now? I mean, it can infuriate him without changing anything in his strategic judgment um, about what he's um, doing. And I think the question still has to be, is are you know, Western countries really serious about energy sanctions actually as something that changes Putin's calculus? And if so, that needs to be like thought through in terms of what the implications are um, for the um, for the world uh, economy. Now, I'm not saying that finding some extra money for Ukraine, financing it for the future, is is in, in, is insignificant. I'm just saying I think it's a secondary question to whether any of us think that energy sanctions can actually change the outcome of this war. Paul, at the back there, yeah. Yeah, another another ex colleague, Mark. Um, what are we learning? Well. What, a straight question. What is the optimum size of a deterrent force that we're going to have to deploy? If we presume that the, the conflict gets frozen in place, the Russian army remains something like what it is, Russian armed forces, what, what size do people think a NATO force is going to have to be? And in the context of that, what are we learning about the way the Ukrainian system works? So you've got reserves, paramilitary National Guard, and professional army interoperating. Well, are any lessons emerging from that early though it is? Um, it's a very good question. I think as NATO now move to implement this new concept that I've talked about, it's accompanied by a, another bit of work called the new force structure work, which tries to much more cleverly integrate uh, the forces of all the allies. You know, at the moment people contribute forces to NATO and they keep perhaps a a separate bit for themselves. The, the idea here is that actually in large parts your forces are part of the NATO uh, response. So I don't think we know the uh, answer to that uh, question uh, yet, particularly because of course we now recognise in the future that, that you can have significant effects in individual domains, be they maritime strike, airstrike, you know, uh, space targeting, all these sort of uh, things. So it's a very good question. I think uh, I would have thought there would be an answer in June uh, if, it's, if it's requested, but probably not uh, until then. And what do you learn about, um, about Ukraine? Well, for this sort of war, you learn that the combined arms grouping is still important. And it's very interesting to see some of their tank brigades have three tank regiments and three artillery regiments. You know, you know, so the Ukrainian weight of, or Russian? Uh, Ukrainian, sorry. Right. You know, the, the weight of artillery that they can bring to bear now, of course, queued, shoot at a sensor very quickly uh, by drones, uh, is, has been the battle winner, as someone said. I mean, end laws, javelins, yes, they're having an effect, but what's really killing people is artillery. So we need more of it. We yeah. need more of it, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, another gentleman here. Uh, Andre Adamson, um, ex uh, armed forces, now work in the defence industry. I'm wondering um, what the panel um, or the extent to which they think that this is an opportunity to recalibrate the relationship between the armed forces and governments and industry. <clears throat> I'm thinking particularly in terms of partnerships um, with, between the customer and industry on setting requirements. Um, weapon stocks and, and dynamic stockpiling, that sort of thing, uh, and also um, attitudes towards sovereignty of defence R&T and how much of that we ought to be outsourcing and how much of it should be sovereign. Thanks. <clears throat> it seems to me that the answer to, to all of that is there in the fairly recently published Defence and Security Industrial Strategy. I think the need is simply now to get on and, and, and deliver that, because the questions you're asking kind of, you know, are as old as the hills, aren't they? I mean, for as long as I've been doing this, which is, you know, 30 plus years, uh, we've been talking about the need for stronger, uh, more strategic, more trustful relationships between government, between the department, the armed forces and defence industry. And I think, you know, realistically, one has seen quite a lot of progress against that. But the fact that we're still publishing things like the industrial strategy and saying there is need to more, need to do more in this, you know, demonstrates 
just that point. Um, of course, there's you know there's big machinery being built in government to do to do this now. I think that the this crisis will accelerate the pressure to do this much more quickly, as you were saying earlier, Mark. And this is kind of you know in 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 munitions in particular. You know we're now having to kind of go very very quick on this, and very much like you know, urgent operational requirements in previous campaigns. We're rather good at doing this when we really need to do to do this. We're much less good at doing it when there's not pressure on it. So surely a big part of the answer is to, you know, capitalise on what we're learning out of um, what's being done in the context of this current crisis and applying that logic straight away to doing exactly what you're describing. Um, time is almost uh, uh, run away from us, but we're going to take two uh, last questions, two final questions. So we'll take them both at the same time and, and then we'll, we'll field those two questions. So please. Hi, I'm Ian Matheson, a retired former Foreign Service officer, British Foreign Service officer. Um, my question really is about uh, the future of Russia. Um, I was struck by Tim Marshall's gloom about this, which I think most of us would probably share to some extent. But it does make me think the title is really a title that asks the defense of Europe against Putin or against any likely successor to Putin. And I wonder really if that's a realistic end. Um, I'm sorry the Ukrainian ambassador's not here, but I'd like to know what the Ukrainians think the future of Russia is. I wonder if there are Ukrainians in the audience who could tell us that. But there might be scope for a little bit more optimism and a little bit more um, sort of creative policy making about how to deal with Russia in order to will the ends that would be better than most of us are now expecting. Um, the Cold War, as I remember, Cold War I ended much, much more suddenly than people at the time expected. And I don't think we should rule out that changes could happen very quickly. I just wonder if the, any on the panel know what the Ukrainian view of the future of Russia is. Okay. Great um, questions. Um, yeah, uh, Robert Tyler from New Direction, the Foundation for European Reform. I, I just want to ask the panel very quickly about resilience. Um, obviously, we see in the defense concepts of countries like Poland and the Baltic states a huge emphasis on this by example in uh, Latvia's 2020 uh, defense concept. They even outlined the role of the church, the government, universities, and primary schools. All right. Uh, why in the West do we not have a sort of similar <coughs> outcome? To that? All right. Well, let's. Um, shall we do Russia with Tim, and then we'll see see because uh, we've got about three minutes. I think. Uh, I live in hope, but not expectation of things getting better. Um, I was with the Ukrainian ambassador last week um, because he was kind enough to ask me to host the charity event where Zelensky's uh, fleece was sold for auction for £90,000. Oh, a quick aside on that one. Boris Johnson was there as well, and I was supposed to be introducing him. And this was election night. And he swapped in, was supposed to come on the stage within two minutes, speak for two minutes, and go. But Zelensky, we couldn't get him up for 20 minutes. So Boris is, Johnson is standing there. Now, you know his life. It's in, lived in 10-minute chunks. I think it says an awful lot that he stood there ruffling his hair for 20 minutes, uh, was patient enough. And I, I know it's a sort of anecdote, but it does show you the resolve and the, the, the relationship. Yeah. Sorry, briefly on, on that. Well, I'll try to be brief on Russia. Again, you just look back at the geography and the history, look back at what happened after the Cold War. Why are they going to change? I hope they do. As for resilience, I think NATO is now again back in fashion, found its raison d'etre. I think that Schultz will look at Macron's strategic um, uh, uh, resilience and think it's not going to be very <coughs> resilient. So I, I think Germany, if it's going to spend this 100 billion, which it says it is, uh, will spend it mostly within the NATO framework, and that is aimed, sadly. It's not aimed eastwards, it's defensive shield is against is eastwards. Just very, so I think on, on Russia, I mean, I deal with the Ukrainian military, so I mean, at the moment, they're very in the moment, so the only good Russian is a dead Russian, and, and perhaps more refined views will come over time, but, but I, you know, I, I don't know. And on resilience, of course, again, you know, NATO leaders have signed up to some pretty hard-nosed resi you know, resilience objectives and enhanced uh, resilience objectives uh, in recent summits. 
Uh, actually, the UK resilience doctrine is very good. Well, how, much, how far down that line we are, I, I, I don't know. But I think it is interesting. I mean, Tim alluded to this. I mean, UK don't tend to educate their populations on the true nature of the threat, unlike perhaps Finland and, and Sweden and Estonia, uh, which makes, I think, delivery of some of these things much more difficult. Thank you all very much indeed. So we are out of time for this session. There is a 20-minute break now. We hope that we may have the Ukrainian ambassador with us, but we certainly have another great uh, session to follow after 11. So uh, I look forward to seeing you all back. And please join me in thanking our fantastic panelists.